Um, Rose Luckin, Professor Rose Luckin is Professor of uh, Learner-Centered Design at UCL's Institute of Education. Her research involves the design and evaluation of educational technology using theories from the learning sciences and techniques from artificial intelligence. She is also the director of Educate, a London hub for tech educational technology startups, researchers and educators to work together on the development of evidence-based or evidence-informed educational technology. Throughout the lockdown, lockdown, Professor Luckin has been working on gathering data to assess actually how effective home learning can really be and what improvements need to be made to ensure that all students are given an equal opportunity to succeed um, remotely. So we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to just turn it straight over to Rose. Thank you so much for being here. We're very excited to hear your lecture. Lovely. Thank you so much for asking me to give this talk. And thank you also to David and the events team. It's been great working with you, getting ready for this over the last few um, weeks. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And as you've been told, um, there will be Slido opportunities. There are four questions that I'm going to ask during the presentation. And I really hope you can give me some feedback through these questions because I'm very interested to know your answers. But throughout the talk, and I'll leave that up just so that you've got a moment to get yourself set up on Slido. Um, what I want to talk about is, is education AI ready? But in particular, what role can and should artificial intelligence play in any transformation of education that happens? Um, how can we use AI to support teachers and learners during a pandemic? What we're looking at now, but also what we might do in the future to improve things to an even greater extent. And then finally, I want to wrap up with a word about how we can get AI ready, as I would call it. Whether you're an educational institution or an educational business, I think there's a lot to be gained from becoming what we call AI ready, which I'll explain when I get to that point in the talk. So I hope you're all Slido ready. And I'm going to start off by talking about education in a pandemic and how AI can help. So, yes, Merry Christmas 2019. There we were, sat there having our turkey or our vegan or vegetarian equivalent, looking forward to a new year. And those of us who are interested and working in the area of artificial intelligence in education were probably pondering questions about the perfect storm that we faced uh, a huge advantage, but also a huge issue that needs to be addressed ethically um, and, and in many other ways too. The perfect storm is the abundance of data combined with very, very sophisticated AI algorithms and enough computing power and memory to process that data using those algorithms. And when I first started studying artificial intelligence back in the 90s, we just didn't have that power and memory. So even if we had the sophisticated algorithms and the data, we couldn't have processed it. And we were also probably pondering the fourth industrial revolution, the changes that that was bringing to the workplace and therefore the changes that that was bringing to education. We may not have been actually thinking about this over our Christmas lunch, but certainly in that point in time, these were the issues that were on our mind. And things like this work being done by the OECD called Learning Compass 2030, which was trying to figure out the kinds of skills, abilities, competencies, abilities that we wanted young people to develop through their education so that they would be in a place to embrace the fourth industrial revolution workplace and in their lives as well. There was a lot of concern about well-being, about agency, about thinking about how we needed to move forward through the 21st century. And then of course, Merry March 2020 and along with our March winds came an unforeseen challenge in the shape of COVID-19 and its consequences. And, and education was suddenly faced with a situation where you had children learning at home via technology if they had it, empty classrooms, students in this lovely picture um, from Spain learning musical instruments out in the open, but then the picture in the middle at the bottom, you know, a child very anxious, very upset, and, and children having to learn wherever they could in families that were locked down. And 
I think a lot of people were doing precisely that help. How do we cope with this? And certainly remote education has relied upon educational technology in a way that has never happened previously. And so my first question is a very simple one to all of you. How useful do you feel technology enabled remote education has been during lockdown? And there should be four options. Very useful, useful, not useful, worse than not useful. So I'm gonna give you a moment to uh, complete that slide question. And I think I will be told when there might be some results that we can look at. And we can also come back and look later to see how those results have changed. But while I'm waiting, I'm just going to move on to the next section of the talk because this will help as we move into thinking about artificial intelligence technology as opposed to educational technology alone. Because obviously there's a difference between educational technology that does use artificial intelligence and educational technology that doesn't use artificial intelligence. Now, I'm just gonna stop sharing for a moment and see if there are any results from that poll. So David, do you know if we have any results from that poll that we can have a look at? Yay, look at that. Great, okay, useful. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear that, that people thought it was useful. Um, and interesting, very useful. So minority of people feeling it's not useful. So that, that's, that's good. I, I'm really pleased to hear that, that's great. Right, I'll start sharing my screen again, if I can. Yeah, there we go. Hopefully we're back on the right page. And so that was educational technology, but what about artificial intelligence? So what sorts of AI is best suited to teaching and learning and in particular in emergencies like a pandemic? Um, and I've long been saying there's so many ways that we can use artificial intelligence to really help us tackle some of the big challenges that we face in education. And the pandemic is an opportunity to really demonstrate the value of educational technology and of artificial intelligence educational technology. So the first way that AI can really help in this situation is through the way that AI systems can adapt to the needs of individual learners. And there are two images there, both taken from systems developed by a company in the United States called Alelo. Um, the one on the right is a, a system for helping develop workplace, workplace skills within individuals. And the one on the left, where you can see an on-screen image of a man with a blue t-shirt, is a system called N-Skills, which is a language learning um, system that you can use through your browser so you can use it anywhere in the world where you have an internet connection and you interact through a conversation with the on-screen character you speak the natural language processing analyzes what you say and the other elements of artificial intelligence work out what that on-screen character should say back to you in order for you to learn the English language and this is a very typical use of artificial intelligence is ability to adapt and it's not just language learning, there are many sorts of adaptive tutors that can help really meet the needs of individual learners, particularly in particular subject areas. And a lot of them look at STEM areas and also language learning. So this is an example from Carnegie Learning, which is a spin-off company from Carnegie Mellon University. And this is an example of one of their systems for uh, post-16 learners who need to catch up with their maths. And so these adaptive education systems provide one-to-one -one tutoring for an individual learner. And they can be very, very effective at helping people understand particular subject area material. It's not a teaching experience, it's a tutoring experience. And they're effective at that tutoring if they're well-designed. And here's an English company called Century Tech 
which has an artificially intelligent learning platform that uses machine learning to try and present to individual learners the right kind of activities and support to help that learner work through the material in the curriculum. And with all of these systems, another very useful piece of that, what they provide is very good feedback for educators, for parents, for the learners themselves about how the learner is progressing through the subject material. Now, another approach, which is a way in which artificial intelligence technologies can really help, technologies that are available now and can be used now, is recommender systems. Now, we're all familiar with recommender systems, the things that we buy where we're recommended a particular product or service based on the preferences that the system doing the recommendation has built up about us as a buyer. Now, we also have these kinds of systems in education. So this is an example of a company called Filtered, which works more in the um, work-based training space. And this is a system that helps you find the right resources to support yourself as a learner. So this is not the same as tutoring you, it's about helping you find the right resources. And if you're a teacher, it's about helping you find the right resources for your learners. And this system also uses some natural language processing to produce um, the interactions through a chatbot. So again, you can talk to the system and it will go away and find the resources that it believes are the ones that you really need to start using in order to achieve your goal. And so it uses that natural learning process, uh, natural learn language processing to understand what you are requesting and to look at the language being used in the resources that are available and then match them together. But we can also look beyond subject-based uses of artificial intelligence in education. This is a system called MyCognition that was originally developed for use in the National Health Service and is available on NHS Online. And then the developers turned their attention to education. It's a system that's about cognitive fitness. It's used in the NHS was to help people who were anxious um, to help prevent some forms of anxiety disorder and depression. But of course, we know that cognitive fitness is very important for learning. So this product and service um, assesses your cognitive fitness, by which I mean it looks at your ability, your long term memory, short term memory, your ability to pay attention and your executive functioning. And on the basis of that, you play a game called AquaSnap and the system uses a little bit of AI to adapt the way you play that game to focus on the elements of your cognitive fitness that your assessment has demonstrated you need the most help with. And then moving on from subject based, we can look at the ways in which AI can be used to help support personal services. So this is a counsellor, uh, an artificial intelligent counsellor used by University of Southern California called SimSensei. And you can see from the, the screen on the left that the analysis is being done by the AI of the student that SimSensei is interacting with, of their facial expressions, the way that they're moving, to try and indicate to the counsellor whether that student is, is anxious, are they listening, or what kind of a state are they in? So it's providing help for this AI counsellor. And just before we leave these current examples, it's not just for older people, we have AI products for very, very early years. So this is a, a little, you can see the cloud with the sun coming out of it. That's a room sensor. This is developed by a, a company called Oya Labs. And it's very much looking at using AI to monitor a child's language and cognitive development with the object of then providing feedback to parents to give them advice about how they might support their child's language and cognitive development. But it's not just about the AI tool that's, that's there that you can see the AI. There are also ways in which we can use AI to enhance the ability of other educational technologies. So here's another example, a system um, developed by a company called Third Space Learning. And I think this is really interesting as a slightly different way of looking at AI. So we all know that one-to-one -one tutoring from a human tutor is the best quality you can have. Yes, we can produce very good AI tutoring systems, 
but their performance is only ever, even when they're very well designed, as good as a human teacher working with a group of students. We have not been able to build an AI tutor that can match a human teaching a learner on a one-to-one -one basis. So we know this is very valuable, but it's also incredibly expensive. So only the privileged can afford it. But what Third Space Learn has developed is a platform that brings together learners who need support with tutors who are available to give that support in parts of the world where it's more affordable. And this platform allows those connections to be made. So we have a learner in the UK and a tutor in India or Sri Lanka providing tutoring. Now, obviously, for this to work, the company needs to know that the tutoring is high quality. So they train all their own tutors and we're working with them to look at how they can use AI to help monitor the quality of those live tutoring sessions. Because one of the big bottlenecks in a system like this is the number of human evaluators you need in order to ensure that all of your tutoring sessions are high quality. Now, if we can help to do some of that monitoring with AI, then we can help reduce the number of humans that you need to do that part of the, the, the system. And more of them are available for doing the tutoring, which is where we really need the help. So now time for a second poll. Now you're very positive about educational technology in a, in a pandemic, but I'd really love to know how aware any of you are about the way in which artificial intelligence has been used in education during lockdown. So again, there are four options. Are you very aware, somewhat aware, not aware, or not at all aware? It'd be great to see your, your answers to that. And I'll come back um, to David to get some, some feedback on that in a couple of moments. But I'll just move forward a little bit uh, while I give you a moment to, to, to put in your answers, because what I want to move on to is to think about the future. I don't personally believe we're ever going to return to things exactly as they were. I, I think I'm not alone in that belief. I think it's not about going back to normal. It's very much about developing, you know, systems that are COVID-19 compliant or pandemic compliant so that we know that we can continue to give a seamless and consistent and good quality education experience whether we're facing something like a pandemic or not. So we need to move ourselves into that kind of space and this is where AI could really come into its own and be a game changer and a lifesaver for, for some individuals. But before I go on to this, I'm now going to go back to David. I'll stop sharing my screen. Whoops. And let's see if we've got any results from that particular poll. Ah, very interesting. So, yeah, not aware. I'm glad that 33% are somewhat aware. That's great. Um, I'm not surprised that the majority of people are either not aware or not at all aware. Um, so it, it's also really good to see that 37% uh, are either somewhat aware or very aware. So that's very helpful for me. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll go back to sharing my screen. Oops, find my mouse. <laughs> there we go. And so what I've looked at so far are existing instantiations of artificial intelligence that are available, that are out there, that are being used. But as I say, we really need to think about the future and think about the potential. But in order to unlock the potential of artificial intelligence for education, we need to think about how we unlock the potential of our human intelligence to embrace the changes that are happening, have happened and will continue to happen in the 21st century and beyond. And I believe that we need to start by looking at human intelligence if we're really going to leverage AI in a way that I believe we can in order to make us still the smartest beings on the planet and to enhance our intelligence and education and learning. 
So what is intelligence? Well, these descriptions here are some that have appeared over history. You know, is it the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills or indeed wisdom or the ability to speak and write Latin and Greek and Hebrew, which was the entrance uh, qualification for getting into Harvard in 150 years ago. So these are all ways in which we thought about intelligence. But of course, we're very, very concerned about how we measure intelligence too, how we recognize intelligence. You know, when we think about artificial intelligence, we often define it as technology that can behave in a way that we would consider intelligence if that behavior was being done by a human. So we need to recognize intelligence. And so Einstein is, is claimed to have said the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. And then Socrates, I know that I am intelligent because I know that I know nothing. Very important one that I'll come back to in a minute, this idea about knowing about ourselves. An emotional intelligence can handle criticism without denial, blame, excuses, or anxiety. Our IQ test over 100. Really? Yeah, we can build AI systems that can score well on our IQ test. So I think we need to move on from that one. Or is it grandmaster at the game of Go? Lots of ways that we might think of recognizing intelligence. How artificial and human intelligence different and why does that matter? So if I was to ask any of you, where have you been this morning? What do you know about artificial intelligence? How well do you understand the COVID-19 pandemic? How are you feeling right now? Now you may not know much about artificial intelligence. You might know a lot. I don't know that any of us feel that we really understand the pandemic. My point is it doesn't matter whether you do or don't know these things to answer these questions, you are able to reflect on your own knowledge and the way you are feeling for the last question. And you are able to give an answer, whether you know something, whether you don't know something. And that ability to understand ourselves is fundamental because artificial intelligence is intelligent in a particular sort of a way. And at the moment we have narrow artificial intelligence that where we have systems that are intelligent, for example, in their ability to play chess or play Go or drive a car or diagnose a, a particular sort of tumor, but they don't have artificial general intelligence. And I think artificial general intelligence is a much more complex thing than perhaps we recognize because our human's intelligence is incredibly rich and really complex. And I don't think we're anywhere near an AI that can do the things that we can do. But some of them, we perhaps don't recognize very much and we certainly don't value enough. And it's very important that we understand these differences because we want our education systems to develop people to complement AI automation, not to repeat it. So if I think about human intelligence, I would suggest that we can think about it as being a very complex interwoven set of elements, not separate intelligences, but complex interwoven related elements. We have our interdisciplinary academic intelligence and that interdisciplinarity is extremely important. The problems we face today are rarely dealt with effectively by one discipline's knowledge. If you think about the treatment of cancer, and the way in which physics has complemented medicine in their diagnostics around cancer. You can see the connection between those two disciplines. And of course, it goes much beyond that. Then we need meta-knowing intelligence. And that's about understanding what knowledge is. Where does knowledge come from? Um, why should we believe something to be true? What's good evidence that could persuade us that a particular thing is or isn't true? It's what we would call a personal epistemology. And, and surprisingly, most people's personal epistemology is really quite naive. And we certainly need that to be much more sophisticated if we're going to be able to spot fake from truth. Social intelligence, I mean, we believe that we do much of our learning through social interaction and social interaction is a core part of the kind of collaborative problem solving that we need to do to tackle the kinds of problems that we need to be able to solve in today's workplace and indeed in our lives. And then there are four more meta sorts of intelligence. When I say meta, it's about reflecting on ourselves. It's about being able to take that slightly distant, metaphorically standing outside ourselves and looking at this sort of intelligence. So I've talked about meta knowing, but there's also metacognitive intelligence, which is about understanding our thought processes, being able, for example, to recognize when 
our attention is being drawn away from what we're trying to focus on and knowing how to bring our attention back. Being able to have an accurate understanding of what we do or don't know. Being able to recognize whether we are progressing in our thinking or not. Being able to regulate what we're doing. Then there's meta-subjective intelligence, which is more than emotional intelligence. It's about understanding how well we are or are not developing that emotional intelligence and how other people who we're interacting with are or are not developing that um, emotional intelligence and how we and they can be helped to develop that better. And then I think the one that we probably underestimate the most, meta-contextual intelligence. As humans, we are able to move throughout the world in a restricted way, admittedly, at the moment, but we can. I know that, you know, I can move in and out of different locations, either digital or physical. I can interact with different people. We can talk about different things. We do it without thinking. We do it seamlessly, but it's incredibly difficult. And I think we really underestimate the value of that. And then finally, there's perceived self-efficacy or perhaps more correctly, I should say, accurate perceived self-efficacy. And this is really old of what we need our education systems to produce because this involves all of the six elements that I've talked about. And it's the way in which we can set goals for ourselves, know accurately how likely we are to achieve that goal, know whether we're motivated towards that goal, know how we can learn the things we do or don't already know because we are accurate in our evaluation of what we do or don't already know. We know how to bring those resources that might be available to us together in order to help us achieve that goal. We are good at learning. We've learned how to learn and we are self-effective in the world. And that's what we want. But I would say that at least at the moment, and I would suggest for a long time to come, if forever, Artificial intelligence really only has interdisciplinary academic intelligence at its fingertips and some elements of social intelligence and some meta-knowing intelligence. Now, certainly with self-driving cars, there's an element of the meta-contextual intelligence, but it's not meta-contextual. It's just having sensors that know the position of where we are. It's not that appreciation that we can have of our ability to move about and change. And so we need to think of this as seven elements, not separate intelligences. All of those elements are essential and five could be considered under meta intelligence. And these are the ones that's really hard for artificial intelligence. So we really need to think about how in education it's these intelligences that we focus on a little more. But the great thing is that this is where artificial intelligence can help us to tackle this particular challenge. We could really use AI to help us foster our own potential, our own intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is about so much more than specific technologies. It's about problem solving. And that's a large part of what we need to do. It's interdisciplinary and it involves psychology and philosophy and linguistics, as well as computer science and neuroscience. You know, the study of AI is complex and the disciplines are all interlinked. It's about understanding intelligence and then thinking about how you automate that intelligence. And so if we think about this in the more broad sense in this problem solving, and we think about the way in which artificial intelligence can use data to improve to learn from that data using sophisticated AI algorithms, then we might be able to start seeing how it can be the real power behind our human intelligence and the sort of human intelligence that we need to develop to keep evolving. I often think that people talk about artificial intelligence and the tremendous strides that have been made in the last couple of decades in particular, and that's absolutely right. But of course, we've also made huge strides in understanding our own human intelligence in that time. And we also need to remember, and it's so important, that our human intelligence is not a finished product. We're still evolving and we still need to involve that intelligence. And it's our education systems that are fundamental to continuing that evolution. 
But let's look at a couple of very specific examples of the ways in which we can use some AI to really help us understand more about these more complex, more nuanced elements of our human intelligence. So the potential for collecting data that's useful in education is huge. We can collect data as people interact with their um, mobile phones, they can talk into their mobile phone, we can collect your dates that way, they can wear different things, whether it's jewellery or clothes, we can collect data from what they're wearing. I wear a, a Garmin fitness tracker, although at the moment it's not terribly a great deal of use because the Garmin have had a few problems, but the point is that I'm wearing it and it collects data about myself. We have observational data from cameras, and of course we have exactly the kind of data that we see all the time where people are interacting with a specific piece of technology. But take this example here where we've got some students who are working together to, to collaboratively uh, try and solve a problem. And so, we're looking at their eyes as they're doing this because we as scientists are studying to try and understand how we can better understand the process of collaborative problem solving and how we might use AI to automatically analyze how well particular groups are or not collaboratively problem solving. So we're collecting data from eye tracking, from hand movements, from the technologies that the students are using as in this example, they're trying to build an interactive toy. But we also need to learn from what we've learnt through the learning sciences of psychology, um, education, other social sciences, also some AI about human learning. And so if we look to psychology, for example, we can build a picture of collaborative problem solving where we can break it down into groups trying to maintain a, a shared understanding, i.e. the social intelligence element, and then the way in which they break down the problem and try and solve the problem. And if we think about how we might look at that, we've got all this data, but how does research that's been done on human learning help us understand what we might use our AI to find within the data that we collect? Because of course, that's what artificial intelligence, particularly machine learning, is very good at doing. So, in fact, if we look to the literature, there are quite a lot of nonverbal signifiers of collaborative problem solving. In other words, things that people do that can be picked up, particularly from um, observational cameras, and that we can use as proxies for saying something positive or negative about collaborative problem solving. So, if we think, for example, about the data that we can get from the hands and eyes. We can think about whether students are looking and the, say, the thing that they're making, are they looking at each other? Are they looking somewhere completely different? Are their hands moving in a synchronous way? Are they you know, moving, doing something totally different? Now, of course, this isn't going to tell us everything we need to know about collaborative problem solving, but it could give us an ingredient and we might be able to collect multiple ingredients to help us understand the nature of collaborative problem solving. So if we think about synchrony, particularly in this example, we can look at how well our students in this example are looking at the same thing or moving their hands, for example. And in order to evaluate whether our analysis that we've done that we can do automatically of those two elements of our data set is in line with say a very skilled human evaluator we asked a very skilled human evaluator who wasn't part of our project to watch the videos of the students and to identify the points at which um, she felt that the students were or were not effectively collaboratively problem solving and she knew the breakdown that we'd done according to that shared understanding social intelligence element and the academic intelligence element of breaking the problem down. And interestingly, when we compared the analysis that our human expert did with our analysis of synchrony, what we found, the orange label represent what our human expert said about these particular sections of the video that she watched of groups of three students, where it says high collaborative problem solving, low collaborative problem solving. This is where they're working well together, low is where they're not working so well together. And you can see that there's much greater synchrony in our analysis of hand and eye movements in the lines that you can see are closer together 
on the high collaborative problem solving groups than the low collaborative problem solving groups. So we have a little indicator that we can analyze using artificial intelligence and we can produce, we did indeed produce machine learning algorithms that could take the data and identify this synchrony feature. Now, of course, we need more than synchrony in order to get a, a flavor of exactly what's going on with collaborative problem solving, but we can certainly start to do some of this. A second example um, of decision making, and this was looking at intuitive decision making, intuitive decision making being done by experts when they were trying to evaluate people they wanted to employ as tutors. And in this instance, it was for tutoring debating. And we wanted to look at whether the sort of multimodal data, which is very, very important to us in the work we do, that I was talking about in that collaborative problem solving example, where you're looking at more than what's the data coming from the machine as the students interacting with it, you're looking at eye gaze, you might be looking at audio tracks, you might be looking at movement, as well as the more standard data set. We wanted to look at what richness, what greater richness we got because of that multimodal data. So of course, we look to learning science as literature to understand more about human decision-making, particularly this intuitive decision-making. And then on the basis of that, we designed a questionnaire, 22 questions. And when we got the responses from the people who were trying to make a decision about the tutors that they were um, employing, and we also recorded, by the way, the, the discussions that they had about the, the, the students that they were, the, the applicants that they were going to employ as tutors for, for, for debating. So we did a principal component analysis of those 22 questions, and we identified four components that explained over 57% of the variance. And you can see in that uh, plot on the top of the screen, those different um, components and the median values of those different components. And then we looked at the audio data. So we had this single mode of data from the questionnaires, and we wanted to know how much better our classification would be of a tutor. Was this going to be a tutor that the experts evaluated as being high, i.e. Um, a four or five, or sorry, no, high was one or two, or low four or five. So you might take the people who were one or two and you might not take the people who were four or five. And when we added in the audio data, we got very high reliance on those one and two and three categories in terms of the classification. So you can see nearly 89% in the most valuable. So certainly the extra modality was incredibly important. And so really I see the potential of artificial intelligence to help us reap the potential of our human intelligence is through what I would call an intelligence infrastructure. It's like electricity for learning. It powers all of our interactions and it consists of the data, that multimodal data from multiple sources, plus the AI algorithms that are designed in the way that is informed by what we've understood about human learning. So I gave the example of collaborative problem solving. I showed how the learning sciences literature informed the way that we designed our algorithms to analyze the data about eye gaze and hand movement. And so the technology side of the infrastructure is the multimodal data plus these smart algorithms designed in a way that's learning from what we've understood over the last couple of decades about how humans learn. And then there's the fundamentally important point of our human intelligence that's also part of that intelligence infrastructure because we need our human intelligence to really interpret what the algorithms are telling us and to know how we then use that information to help people learn. And if we get this intelligence infrastructure notion of AI, then that can power all of the interactions that we have as we learn, whether they're through technology or whether they're through standard a teacher working with a learner, or even when we're alone reading a book, if we know what we do understand, what we don't understand, how we're progressing, how, how we learn effectively, when our attention's likely to be dragged away and, and how we might pull it back, if we've got an accurate understanding of ourselves, we can be more effective at learning. And this is really 
you know, the power of what we can do. And it's not just for able-bodied. We could really enhance many of the technologies that are supporting people with particular difficulties, whether it's intelligent exoskeletons or whether it's intelligent glasses that not only can help blind people see, but can help them learn too. It's this power of the human and the artificial intelligence working together that really matters. So huge potential, but my final question for you, and this is where the word cloud comes in. How can we unlock the potential for AI to transform education in the UK? And so I want you to give me some words that will tell me how you think we should unlock the potential for AI to transform education in the UK. Because transform we must if we want to be pandemic compliant, if we want to be able to cope with whatever the world has to throw at us. And I'm going to leave that one with you while I do the final few slides um, of this presentation. And so how do I think AI and education um, can be brought through this transformational change? Well, I think there are two fundamentally important things that we have to do to get there. The first is, I think we must move more towards a participatory design process with multi-stakeholder partnerships. And indeed, um, at uh, UCL as part of the Educate project that ran there from 2017 to 2019, we work with 272 small businesses to help them understand how they could use data and evidence to build better, more effective educational technology products. And it was really interesting. And it gave us a very, very good idea about the methodology and the process that we need to use when AI is part of that educational technology equation. With that data and that evidence and that research at its heart, because what we really need to do is to recognize that most people developing AI for education don't know anything about teaching and learning. And most people teaching know loads about teaching and learning, but don't know much about AI. But we need both those expertise to develop the best AI. So, we need those groups to work together. And through working together, not only do we develop much better applications of AI for education, we also help the AI developers to understand more about teaching and learning. And we help the teachers and the learners to understand more about AI. And this is all part of this golden triangle, as we said on Educate. It's where you build the technology developers you bring the technology developers together with the people who use the technology and the researchers who can help them understand how to talk to each other and how to use data and evidence to demonstrate the value of what they're doing. So that's the first way. And the second way is this process of helping educational institutions and indeed educational businesses to get AI ready. So we have developed this ethical, AI readiness methodology. Um, and that's certainly the work that we're doing at Educate Ventures at the moment. Um, there are seven key steps to getting your organization ready to leverage the transformational power of AI. And we formed it into this ethical AI readiness step. Now, the reason it's called ethical is to have constantly at the front of our minds that ethics are fundamentally important in the way that we develop AI for use in education. But we need to get people on board first. Then we need to look at the challenges that a particular institution is facing. We need to look at the data they have available to them. We need to learn from that data. We need to collect it. We need to identify any new data they might need to collect. And we need to apply some of our AI techniques to that data to understand more about the problem, the challenge that is being faced. And we use this technique with a company who trained traders and indeed we collected multiple different sorts of data behavioral data from questionnaires recruitment data trading history data multimodal data from eye movements and button clicks and in that way we modeled using learning machine techniques to build profiles of traders that were able to allow us to make predictions about who would be successful and who wouldn't be successful and from that unpacking that the, the problem that the company faced, which was too many people were leading their, leaving their business after they trained them, we are now helping that company to build much more effective recruitment tools and mentoring tools. But it's because we'd used AI to unpack the problem that they were facing 
through the data they had and through collecting extra data. And so this AI readiness is really about mapping an organization's data, information, knowledge and wisdom pyramid. Because we need to think about how we can use the data that they've already got. What's there? What's right? What can we have now? And what can we, can we learn from previous efforts? How, how, how has the company developed? What hypotheses have they developed and where are their blind spots? We can find these in the data. And we need to know how we're getting things right. So it really is this pyramid where we have both inductive and deductive processes in the data, and then we interpret and apply and interpret and apply in order to help us become wise about that business. Now, my final question to you, um, and then I'll come back and look at both the answers to the word cloud. And this one is, how ready is your organization to leverage AI? More than ready, we're all using AI already. Somewhat ready, some people are using AI. We're aware of AI, but not yet using it. Not at all ready, it's not on our radar. So I'm gonna leave you to answer that question. Um, and just as a final passing note, really stress the importance of ethics. I believe that the ethics when it comes to AI for education is so important that I co-founded the Institute for Ethical AI and, Educa and in AI in Education with Sir Anthony Seldon and Priya Lakhani, a social entrepreneur, because there's fantastic work going on already in the UK on ethics and data and ethics and AI, but nobody was focusing specifically on education. And for me, education is what matters because what we need to develop is a kind of education system that will help us develop our human potential, the human potential in every learner. So, conclusions. COVID-19 may change the way that we teach and learn forever. And I really hope that it will, because I think we can provide people with a much better education. And AI has a key role to play in that transformation. Its application in education can support teachers and learners now, but more importantly, we've got to look towards the future and consider how AI can support a COVID compliant transformation of our education system. A transformation that seeks to enable all learners to achieve their full potential. And this means, yes, leveraging artificial intelligence, but also changing the way that we value our own human intelligence. And it means that we need to move beyond current phase where we look at AI as individual devices and applications to the stage where we've evolved into this notion of infrastructure. That's what will help us to continue evolving our own human intelligence, because that's what we must do to unlock the learner, the human potential in every learner. And I will leave this slide up there just for a moment. Um, anybody who's watching the video or looking at this later can pick up these references. Um, they're just references to papers, academic papers that um, give you a little bit more information about what I've talked about. And there's also my book in there, um, Machine Learning and Human Intelligence, The Future of Education for the 21st Century, which goes through those elements of human intelligence and explains the research evidence for why I believe that's a way of looking at human intelligence that's useful in an AI world. But if you're interested in the notion of AI readiness, we have some free webinars that you can attend just like this one, or indeed that you can see you later. Um, go to this website, educateventures.com webinars. Um, you'll find all the information and we have a great one coming up on Thursday, uh, 4 p.m. on Thursday, which is looking at how a business can learn from its data, how an education and training business can learn from its data. And I, I really know that that's going to be a great one. So I'll leave that there for a moment, um, but certainly hope that uh, you can watch it again later to get the details if they're useful to you. And thank you very much for listening to me today and for answering the questions. I'm really excited to know what your answers to the, the, the last question and the penultimate question are. Um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing now and see if we can find out those answers. Thank you. Right, okay, so somewhat ready. 
some people are, oh, that's brilliant. 43% are somewhat ready. That's great. Um, aware of AI, but not yet using it. Yeah, not at all ready, not on our radar. I think that depends on where you, where, what, what kind of industry you're working in. Um, so, yeah, somewhat that's good. We've got, oh, it's changing. Oh, <laughs> yeah, interesting, very interesting. So it's looking like uh, what we've got. We've got 54% uh, plays, 46%. Uh, so aware, but not ready, uh, not at all ready. Um, interesting. Um, my, it, my experience tells me that certainly in the case of many educational institutions, um, the level of AI readiness is quite low. Um, and, and that's a lot because those institutions are not used to looking and learning from their data at an institutional level. Um, I was speaking to an ex-head of a further education college who's now chair of governors at a further education college a couple of weeks ago. And he said, well, the only data we collect is the data that we have to collect for accountability. So it's financial or it's about um, test scores. And yet there's a wealth of information that could be collected and analysed in order to help us understand that institution better and to understand how to tackle some of those problems, possibly using AI. And uh, I don't know if the word cloud is also ready to share. That would be fascinating to, to oh. Oh, yes, uh, collaboration. Interesting. Very interesting. Completely agree. Collaboration is definitely a key part of uh, tackling this situation. Transparency, great, yeah. User-led, explainability, yeah, trust, absolutely participatory, fantastic. Uh, can we leave that up there, David, while we talk, or does it need to go down? Okay, mm -hmm. great, we can leave that up there. Fantastic, thank you, everybody. That's, uh, I, I need to make sure I get a screenshot of that. <laughs> we'll send it to you, Russ. Thank you. Much appreciated. So we already have a, a, a very good group of questions for you. And so I'll, I'll um, try to draw, draw together a few of them with, with the initial question that I also wanted to ask you. Um, sure. Which, which, is, which is really you know, starting from the, the kind of ethics angle. And, and it has to, I guess it, it really has to do with bias and discrimination. So you know, in a sense, we, we know that um, there are there are bias, there is bias in in data sets in Absolutely. design sort of processes with regard to machine learning and implementation processes with regard to machine learning and and especially when we think about data sets um, and just think here about computer vision data sets and and the types of of uh, structural you know discrimination that show up in these types of data sets and and when I see slides about sort of a uh, high dimensional system picking up behavioral cues and using that to interpret uh, how to, or, or interpret in scare quotes, but using that to steer behavior in one way or another. Um, it just, it raises a flag for me that how can we sort of approach this in a way that is sufficiently attentive to the, the, the bias and discrimination in data sets. And, and the second note of that question really quick would just be, on the other side of bias and discrimination, there's this, the, the, the kind of potential inequity in, mm -hmm. in use and deployment, which is to say, how do we make sure that the, it's justly distributed the benefits of this type of, of educational technology, right? Because in a sense, we face both local digital divides vis-a-vis -vis, you know, those who, are, who have been left out, right, of, of access to technology, but also global digital divides in terms yeah. of differences between the global north and the global south and, and the various other ways that you've got, you know, low and, low and middle income countries that aren't able to marshal this type of, you know, technological ecosystem in ways that other uh, higher in income countries are able to do it. So two noted question, but I think that's a good start. Yeah, I, I, that's, and it's such an important question. I mean, so to think about the data first, I mean, I really think a lot of the problems with the systems that uh, where they're, they're, I mean, of course there's bias. And we've had some huge faux pas um, with images not racializing black faces, with recruitment software only recruiting men. You know, we know that, that there's problems. And I honestly think that a, a lot of that is down to a non-inclusive approach as to, to the collection of data. I mean, if we look at um, the workforce in the companies that collect that data, 
they're hardly very diverse. So I think one thing is to increase the, in, increase the attraction of a diversity of people to work in AI, because I think that would help enormously. And, and a second really practical thing I think we can do is, you know, ethics courses in, in a lot of AI and computer science um, degrees uh, or other sorts of, of training courses are often optional. And you know, we are improving and more of them are becoming compulsory, but it needs to be something that's there throughout and integrated into the learning so that we are constantly made aware of our ability you know, to be biased and, and the problems that that can cause. So you're absolutely right about the data. And I think when it comes to education, it's even more important because you know, this is somebody's, we know that you know, education changes lives. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Education changes lives. And you know, we also know that those very early years are the ones where we probably have the greatest opportunity to change life as well. And sometimes we don't do it very well. Um, you know, so data, it's fundamentally important that we get the most inclusive data sets when we're training any kind of AI. And I also understand your concern about what I'm talking about with that that's kind of collecting lots of data and, and looking at behavioral signifiers. And of course, it's a risk. You know, I see the benefits, and that's why I talk about it in a positive way, because I want people to reap those benefits, because I actually believe it's a hugely powerful technology for breaking down some of the inequalities that we have in society, for recognizing intelligence that's different to the one that we recognize at the moment, which is so important. But I do, of course, recognize the huge problems that it brings ethically. And it's not just in the data or indeed in the way that with machine learning it's hard to know why decisions have been made i think it's also an area that's really under researched in education at least in, in educational ai and that is the whole decision making process the sort of interface between the human and the ai you know at what point do we feel comfortable with an ai making a decision about something so for example if i think about the collaborative problem solving examples that I used. I think we probably feel okay with the AI making a decision that the synchrony in the way some hands are moving or some eyes are moving. Okay. Would we be happy with the AI making a decision about the extent to which that might influence an evaluation of collaborative problem solving? Maybe less comfortable. Maybe we want that to be a joint decision, whereas a human we can look and say, okay, we've got 50 different signifiers actually we think these are the most important but then of course we've got to help the human understand what that means and we've got to build good interfaces to help that joint decision making but then there's going to be some decisions that should only ever be made by a human you know i would hate to think um that we would move into an education system where a child's future um was decided by an AI algorithm that said, well, actually now I think this child needs this sort of education and this child, and we did it of course with the 11 plus, we still do, but a kind of an AI version of that would be terrible. And that's not where I'd like to see us go at all. But I think we need to work out that, that we have to help people understand more about AI, particularly people in education so that they can do that joint decision-making process. So that they can really, benefit from what we can do with big data and AI to enhance their human teaching abilities, capabilities, and I think enjoyment as well. But it is really important. And I could have done a whole lecture on ethics and it, because it is that important, but I, I really wanted to give a positive, to give the potential benefits, but absolutely, there's a lot of um, ethical dilemmas that we have to address. So actually one of the audience uh, asks a kind of, I think a positive question that has to do with this, um, which is, um, I'll just read it for you. So to unlock human potential in every learner is a great vision for AI enhanced education. Children from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds are currently underperforming against their richer peers yeah. in current education system. Do you think there is a role for AI to close the gap? And, and I would even say, how can we think of marshalling AI to, you know, specifically work on, you know, e leveling the playing field, if you will, in education? I absolutely do. I mean, it's what got me into AI and education in the first place. Um, 
I, I didn't go to university when I first left school. I went slightly later and I actually um, did, did quite a bit of teaching um, before I studied artificial intelligence. And I, for a while, taught in a, um, a secondary school, probably not very well, um, some very challenging students from very poor backgrounds. And I felt deeply frustrated that it was hard for me to find a way of officially validating the things they were good at. There wasn't anything in the system that recognized some of the really great quality. I mean, a lot of them were incredibly resilient. They had to deal with terrible stuff at home and still got themselves up and dressed in the morning and got themselves out. You know, but you can't, how do you recognize that in a, in a GCSE or, it was really, really hard. And it, and it, it did really, you know, bring me to the way I think about artificial intelligence in education, because I think, of course, there's a risk that if we design the signifiers of the course of system that I'm, you know, talking about the, the proxies for, for what we want to evaluate, if we don't do that well, then there's a huge risk that we only recognize the qualities that we know our more privileged learners are likely to display. But you know, if we really take care in how we do it, I think we could open up the talents that are available to us in some of the children who underperform in the world. Because I believe with a passion, when I go into a group of very young learners, say three-year-olds, it's much harder um, to pick out those who are disadvantaged. Yes, of course, their language skills won't be as good, you know, but they'll all be enthusiastic. They'll all be curious. They'll all want to learn something. If I meet that same group when they're 16, oh, you can tell straight away, you know? And I think it, it's that that we've got to tap into. It's that ability to, to recognize things that are not standardly recognized at the moment. And it's also the way in which we can use AI to address students' needs. I mean, when I've taught in, in challenging circumstances, it's incredibly difficult when you've got students with multiple complex needs to meet all of them while you're also trying, because those complex needs might be very able students as well. It's very difficult to do that. Now, AI can really help us with that. So if we can come up with a system that recognizes more than the standard things we recognize at the moment, and if we can make sure that we provide that really enhanced support through our AI systems. I think we really can do something. I mean, what bothers me enormously about the current situation, for example, is that I think when all children do finally at some point return to school, it's gonna be incredibly difficult for any teacher because no matter what's happened for the majority, every child will have had a different experience, will have learned different things. How is that teacher meant to diagnose and support all those amazingly different things? And yet that's exactly what AI could do. Mm. You know, we really could. And then that means we really can help those who've had perhaps a less positive experience when they've been out of school to quickly, you know, get up to speed. Yeah, I mean, the, in, in a sense, we, we face these kind of new challenges with the pandemic, especially um, mm. is of how quickly society itself is changing. And, and actually this relates to one of the questions that we got, which, which really has to do with, in a sense, the brittleness of, of, of some data-driven systems, which is to say, yeah. when the underlying distribution shifts, like such as in the case of a, of a globally, societally changing pandemic, you have an entirely different kind of environment off of which then a, a system would need to relearn if it, if it, if it were taking up kind of cultural, sociocultural cues and, and, and using those in its processing. Um, so how do we deal, I mean, the question I guess is, how do, how do we deal in this area in education, which is very, I mean, it, it, it is change, a changeable space. How do we do deal with that kind of shift, distributional shift and, and the, the kind of rapid changes? Brilliant question, yes. Um, well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that it happens you know, and know that we have to do something. We absolutely always have to have a human in the loop because of course humans are less brittle <laughs> in the main. Although of course humans can be very biased as well and, and the AI can help us spot that. But yeah, we definitely always need a human in the loop. But I think that's a, what's really important about this piece is also that, you know, if I just look at that 
very small example of hand movement and eye gaze, there'll be cultural differences in different parts of the world as to how that, what that signifies in the same way that with facial expressions, there, there are differences. So we already have complexities in terms of recognizing um, change uh, across the globe uh, as we try and build these systems. So I think, and that's again, where you need the human very firmly in the place where the decisions are made. Because I think there's, I could imagine a situation where there's a huge temptation to offload too much to the AI. And then I think that brittleness will become a real problem. I think we need to recognize absolutely what AI is good at and what it's not good at and recognize what humans are good at and what they're not so good at. And it, that's why that complementarity is so important. And I think if we can really focus on that, where's the decision making happening? Where's that happening? Then I think that would help with that particular problem because we may want to sometimes have that decision making actually very, very low level for the AI. But again, we have to help the humans understand it enough in order for them to be in the loop enough to help prevent that brittleness becoming a problem. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's I, I often think about AI and education, you know, through three lenses. Yes, there's the way we can use AI. Um, and there's the way that we need to change our education systems because of AI, you know, the fourth industrial revolution, et cetera. But then there's also this business about how we need to help people understand AI. But it's not that we need everybody to be able to learn Python or we need everybody to, you know, understand the kind of calculus that sits behind, um, you know, a neural net or whatever. We need them to understand what the AI is capable of and what the implications of that are, and then how they can work with that AI. And that's the bit, I think that's the real key to that piece. Well, I mean, and, and this is a question, a couple of questions as well we've gotten on this, which is this complementarity dimension, which is to say, if we treat the, you know, at least the near future of AI as being a kind of tool technology, a technology yeah. to yeah. augment or enhance our capacities to, you know, improve or develop, then how do we set ourselves up to win? Which is to say, yeah. what, what is the component of readiness, the, this idea of, of readying? Um, the, uh, I think you've, you've frozen for a second, Rose. I don't know if, if uh, let's see. Maybe hopefully you'll come back in a second. You back with us, Rose? I am, yes, I, I couldn't, um, oh, I can't turn my video on, but I'm back. You can hear me, yes? Okay, yes, definitely. I don't yes. know, I can't unlock my video, but hey, let's get on with it, yes. Because I was just wanting to answer that question about, uh, we, have to, we have to change the way we evaluate success, basically. We have got to stop only really looking at academic intelligence in our education. So we do look at more than that, but, you know, I, I, but we do focus on that. And I think we really need to think about how we can have a much richer way of evaluating what we see as success. Because, you know, the classic phrase, you know, we treasure what we measure and we, we measure what we treasure. Well, we need to treasure different things and measure different things because that's how we really can, can bring about change. And of course, you know, and that will help us to stay ahead. And it's perfectly right that at this point in the evolution of artificial intelligence use in education, we are at the tool stage, it's fine. You know, and the more that we can build good tools and help people to use them effectively in education, the more people will understand about AI. And then when we move on to the kind of more infrastructure phase, they will be much better able to do that kind of decision-making process with AI to feel more comfortable about, well, where is my line? You know, where's the red line? Where do I not want that, that AI to make the decision? Where do I feel okay about offloading that? Um, so I think, yes, it, it, it's good, but I, but I think we also need to move away from the kind of narrow evaluation that we tend to focus on. And, and of course, again, AI can help us with that because you know, we can do so much formative assessment in the background with AI um, that can really help um, take away the anxiety and the time waste that we have with stop and test approaches. But we kind of need to have that built so that 
the current decision makers kind of let go of what they valued for, you know, I know that you can't just stop, um, but there's a lot we can do. So uh, we, we have an interesting question from Alan Wilson, uh, you know, who's our former director, et cetera. Yes. Um, and it has to do with the, the sort, of, um, sort of starting line of, of thinking about AI in education. And, and he sort of observes that um, the early years is definitely a good start in education, but, but this starts at home before children, children actually yeah. you know, go through the front doors of the schools. And so the question is how can AI educate parents um, with human intelligence? So what, like where, where does AI fit into that kind of early childhood scene? Such an important question again. I mean, parents are crucial in, in all of this. Um, many years ago, um, and there is relevance, I am gonna answer the question, but, it, but, it's, it, but it's an interesting example. We had a very, very early um, prototype built with um, children of four and five. So again, that's older than Alan's asking about, but, um, and that, we were told we were mad to be trying to build a technology prototype with children of that age. And we, we used participatory design, we involved the parents in the process of developing. This wasn't, well, it did actually use some AI in the background actually, a little bit. Um, but it, we involved the parents and the teachers in the process and that really helped. And it helped to engage them and actually it, that the system was successful and, and the research project was successful and we learned a lot from it. And the one thing I really learned from it was you have to engage the parents in the process. I mean, I would love to see, um, one of the, the people we're talking to at the moment about the whole piece around AI readiness is a nursery. And that's music to my ears. You know, let's start at the nursery level. Let's start with developing, you know, the kinds of infrastructure in a nursery that can really help and get the parents involved as well because parents tend to have much more involvement with their young child's education as their children get older and they quite understandably develop their own private educational life they don't necessarily want so much parental involvement but you know the younger we go the more naturally there is parental involvement and I think we can really reap the benefits of that by working with organizations like nurseries to, to, to really try and help to get into the home. But also there are some great technologies already. When I think about the Educate program, you know, for example, um, an app like Easy Peasy, mm -hmm. which, is, which is an app that is basically for parents to help parents understand what kinds of games they can play with their very young child. And there's videos that the parent can watch. The games don't necessarily include technology at all. That's not the point. But it's actually really engaging with parents, giving them very useful things that they can do, that they can see will help them and that they have the resources they need to do it. And I think we need to approach parents' involvement with AI in the same way. So I think working through a nursery would be a great start, but of course we also need to work um, outside of the sort of institutional piece with, with parents um, more generally. And it's about, again, getting them AI ready, which is why I you know, feel so passionately about the AI readiness piece is that the more people we can help to get AI ready, the more we can help, for example, parents understand how it can help them with their young children and then it's an easier piece to then work with them mm. to help develop the right kinds of things. I love the Finnish approach, you know, the 1% project where they decided that they would educate 1% of the population to mm. be able to use AI through the Elements of AI program developed at a university and now available free online. It's a really nice little course. Actually, it's not that little, but a nice course. Um, and they've succeeded. They've educated 1% of the population. Um, if we were doing this, we probably said, oh, let, let's uh, educate 87% of the population and could fail the abysmally, or maybe not 87, but you know what I mean. 1% was a great target and they succeeded. And now that 1% can help educate the others. And obviously they'll increase from there. And that's really singing to this piece about AI readiness. But it's great. I completely agree. The younger you know, we can start and with parents, the better, the more likely of, likelihood of success. So it, it looks like uh, we're, we're down to the, our last few minutes and we've been defeated by great questions because they just- It's great to have great questions. <laughs> uh, 
So I want to I want to combine a couple of them perhaps and uh, and sort of put them under the the umbrella of assessment. So yeah. you know, in a sense, um, as a teacher myself uh, for for many years, um, we know that there's this component of interpretation and judgment and. I'm going to say it, empathy when it comes yeah, to really yeah. understanding students' papers, right? I mean, when, I re when I've when i read some gems of papers, it's taken a little bit longer if they haven't been necessarily written as well, but have great ideas. In them. Um, and so there's that capacity to sort of be patient and judge and interpret through our kind of capacities. And um, so the question about AI and assessment would be an evaluation. Do we lose something? Um, if we start to offload, right, that, that process of interpretation, judgment, um, empathy and reading uh, onto the mechanical system? Yeah, it's such a good question. And, and I can relate to it so well. When I was studying for my O-levels, I am that old, um, I did O-levels. I did my mock O-levels and I was pulled to one side by several teachers who looked at me and said, you've got to learn to write. <laughs> you, you know, your writing is appalling. And we know there's some great ideas in here, but we really can't read it. And that's a similar thing, you know, an AI might really struggle with that, but the human could see that there was something there. And of course it was great advice and I did work really hard. I was just wanting to get it all down as quickly as possible, but you, I, so I get what you're saying. Yes, but then there's, there's a, that's a, that, there's a, there's a, a multi-part attack to, 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 um, process that we need to have. So we need to think about what are the right ways of assessing. Um, because maybe the written word isn't the right way for some people because they that it's a barrier for them to really shine so we might think more about spoken word or we might think about different ways of assessing and then the AI can adapt to that but I think there's that piece I think there's also the fact that I would say AI's role in assessment is much more in the formative space much more in looking at you know the, the infinitesimal detail of data we can collect and analyze can help to identify the micro steps that can then be useful to the human in helping the learner. And as the learner learns more, the learner themselves understanding. So I would say, I think there's much more potential for AI in the formative assessment piece. I know people talk about automating exams and AI market exams. I think that, that's not, I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I'd say AI instead of exams. Um, of course, being able to produce a coherent narrative to explain something is really important. So I would never suggest getting away, doing away with that, but maybe we need to think differently about what the format of that is. But fundamentally, it's that human in the loop again, isn't it? You know, if a decision is gonna be made about someone on the basis of that piece of writing, then we need to make sure that the, the right combination of human and AI a part of that decision-making process. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a it's such a it's it's a difficult topic, right? Because you know, it is really difficult, you know. And of course, you've always got to remember, uh, and, and it's a double-edged sword. We cannot experiment with people's lives, you know. So we can't suddenly change the assessment system and 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 uh, without having something really really good to replace it with. And yet, with COVID, we have experimented with people's lives, and and we need to learn how we need to do better. It's always double-edged, isn't it? But yes, we have to be very careful. Right, and that brings up also, how, how do we evaluate and assess the effectiveness of the machine learning systems themselves without randomized control trials and the various yeah. other ways yeah. we want to validate yeah, yeah, yeah. the system? Yeah, and, and it's a moving target. It's always very difficult because you're actually trying to change the status quo rather than measure the status quo. You know, you've got to want to change it. So I think you have to think of very new ways of evaluating the success. And it, it may be that, you know, it's about the kinds of people, you know, it's that classic thing. We've got to decide what success looks like and then work back from that to think, okay, how do we evaluate that? But the, the final thing I'd say is, I think the big risk at the moment is in doing nothing. And I think doing nothing is the bit that could damage people. We need to do something and we need to have a vision and we need to work towards that vision, even if we're only making small steps, but we owe it to, to, to to, to the population of learners and teachers to, to start making some steps, I think. Well, just on behalf of everybody, let me just thank you uh, 
Professor Pleasure. Wendt for, for a, a really wonderful lecture that, that sort of spans an impressive range of problems and, 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 and was, as you said, you know, hopeful and, and look, sort of pointing the way forward. Good. I'm glad it came across as hopeful. <laughs> it is. And but thank you also for the great questions. Uh, I love people asking questions because I learn every time somebody asks me a question. Our pleasure. So, uh, and thank you. We'll make the uh, we'll make the slides available. Can we do that? Yes. 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 We will, we will make the slides available, and uh, I'll also point out. I don't know if you can see uh, in our in our sort of windows here. Yes. Um, we have coming up on August twentieth, Thursday, from uh, three to four thirty. A uh, professor, uh, Desmond Upton Patton, from uh, he's from the School of Social Work at Columbia University. He'll be exploring the role of social media in and out of lockdown mm. um, and how he's been using AI to identify the challenges faced by young and vulnerable people online. So please uh, register for that, uh, uh, Rose and, and others. <laughs> if you're Sounds interested. great. <laughs> and uh, and uh, just, you know, once again, thank you so much. And, and on, on behalf of the Alan Turing Institute, and all of our audience members, thank you so much for, for spending uh, a couple of Thank you hours. for inviting me. <laughs> Pleasure. Bye.